and welcome to episode 183 of The Dive Down, a Magic the Gathering podcast focused on the latest decks, trends, and strategies for the casual spike. My name is Stanislav here in Chicago, and with me on the line from Denver, Colorado, back from the Aloha State, it's the one and only, you know him, you love him, you missed him, we got letters, where is he? And we wrote back, he'll be here soon. <laughs> I don't even have to say the name. You're all saying it at us on the radio that you're listening to this podcast. I guess it's more of a Bluetooth speaker. Enough about me. It's Shane Beeps. Aloha. That means hello and goodbye. So who knows if I'm coming or going? And it's also kind of a way of life, right? It is. Yeah, the, yeah live aloha, baby. I, I'm impressed you're still wearing your lays. Yeah, I'm, they're getting a little funky. A little fun, but you know what? How would how else would everyone know that I was in Hawaii? And, and is it true that you're sleeping in in the lays? Uh, that's you know this is this is a family friendly podcast, Stanislav. It's just a necklace of flowers. You, you can sleep in that. My, my favorite flavor point. of lays is barbecue. I don't know. <laughs> the pickle ones are pretty good too. I like pickle lays. Yeah, the pickle ones are pretty good. Also, with us, it's, it's the Godfather, the pickle king of Chicago. The original meat man. It's Dave Harbarger. <laughs> I, I didn't expect to be able to follow up that intro that you gave to Shane. So uh, it's fine. I'm good. I'm here again this, this week. We'll see. Maybe I'll be here next week. Maybe not. I don't know. But uh, it's all right. The sausage king of Chicago. Every week you can count on us to be here making the sausage. That's what we do here on the dive down. Sausage up these takes and ship them out. Have y'all ever made homemade sausages? Have one time, I took a class in making homemade sausages at Butcher and Larder here in Lincoln Park in Chicago. Oh, man, that, that place is good. And uh, it was pretty interesting and gross. So I did not do it again. You don't need a class. You can just buy the casings and m- mince some meat. Yeah, but it's about learning the balance. I learned about the yeah, ratio the seasonings. of seasonings and fat to meat and all that kind of stuff. I just buy like vegan sausages and they taste bad. I learned about the difference between a Frankfurter, a Bratwurst, and a Mousseline, and I am ready to never do anything with any of that knowledge ever. At least you know what a Mousseline is. I don't even know what that is. What, what, what kind of casing does a vegetarian or vegan sausage use? What stores pl- the soy? Plastics. <laughs> it's just microplastic. <laughs> it's macroplastics. <laughs> On this week's show, we are going to continue our focus on modern as we chat a little bit about our recent forays on the RCQ circuit. Do we actually all do modern decks this week? We did. When's the last time we've done that? I can't even think. Well, considering it's usually your fault if we don't. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I wasn't, it was not me. pointing fingers. I was just stating facts. <laughs> I, I got mad at my dad in a text exchange a couple weeks ago, <laughs> and uh, he corrected something that my sister said in our group text, and I said, Dad, we don't need you to be pedantic right now. This isn't a time for that kind of stuff. And he goes, I'm not being pedantic. I'm just stating a fact. <laughs> and by my knowledge, what a dad. and I didn't want to be pedantic by saying, you should go look up what pedantic means. But um, dads, am I right? Oh, yeah. That's a good point. So true. Anyway, Shane, state your facts. Facts stated. Moving on. Yeah, I, I guess, Shane, what you're alluding to is the fact that we're already ignoring Zach's Al- Zach Allen's advice from last week, who told us to play one of the good decks. And instead, we're going to fire up a classic Sleeve Believe He with three more bad decks. I love bad decks. I don't know. Maybe they're not all bad. Maybe we're bad. I mean, mine was fun. It's an open question right now. It could be a real bizarro world, though, if Stan and I are both like bleh, yucked out, and Shane is like, "This was great." Like that would be that would be a real twist for summer. Hey guys, Chalice of the Void is actually a pretty cool card. <laughs> That's called for it ca- it, it, It's it's like casting a counter spell without casting it. Yeah, at least you finally figured out how to use it. So stay tuned. Dave is going to basically talk about how he's not smart enough to play modern decks. I think I'm going to talk about how and why prowess is not cool and shane is going to talk about how much he loves artifacts and other colorless things love them baby love artifacts hate cascade spells i like that you looked at my note where i said the deck that's not not smart enough to play the deck that i chose and you just went straight to dave's not smart enough to play modern that's uh show me the lie that's rough (laughs) yeah before we process all of this trauma let's housekeep we got some new patrons who joined the Dive Down Nation this week. Justin F., Jared K., and Luis. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Also, shout out to Nicholas D., who went up a tier in their support. 
Nicholas D now owns a portion of the dive down. He's, a, he's an investor. A true investor in the show. Thank you all four of you. Appreciate you very much. We also got a couple new reviews. We got one from LMTG. Do you think that's Luis? Do you think Luis is Luis Scott Vargas? Do you think? It's LF, probably. LF, is he finally, finally recognizing? Giving us a kickback? Probably. Yeah. Well, whether whether or not it's Luis, LMTG called us informative and entertaining. And I think today we're going to challenge both of those notions. From Canada. You know how hard it is to entertain people in Canada. It's impossible. Luis moved to Canada? I thought he was a Denverite. We also got a review from Mike Max. And uh, Mike, all I'm going to say is we appreciate you too. If you'd like to support the show, you can find us over on Patreon. Patreon.com slash the dive down. Shane, Dave, did we pay the final deck box installment? No. Checks in the mail. Check it literally, in the mail. Checks, li- okay. Literally okay. check in the mail. Okay. Well, that's good. So we can talk about that. So are they... In Los They're Angeles, in the United States, in the port of Los Angeles. No, they are in Minnesota, I believe, where Legion Collectibles is. They have them. We have seen pictures of them. They look great. We're not going to send them out. We're not going to remind anybody what we, they look like before we send them. We're going to send this first batch, and then we'll start popping pictures up to try to get some more people up to that five dollar a week level to get deck boxes. But they will be coming soon, and by soon, I mean. Four to six weeks, depending on the speed of your local postal carrier. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, if if you are interested in the deck boxes that are finally here, uh, it's you get to you go over to patreon.com slash dive down, sign up for five bucks a week for three weeks, gets you kind of past the plateau that we're arbitrarily assigning to the deck box. But even a dollar a week gets you into the definitively discreet dive down discord. Uh, you can access to things like tokens and play mats and stickers and pins. And yeah, it's uh, it, we love having people join the community. We love having people get sweet swag. Uh, Stan, didn't one of our overseas patrons finally get their play mat after like weird customs and postage issues? Yes. Yes. Uh, one of our Norse patrons, I sent it out to them for the, the first time I sent it out to them was around Christmas of last year. And then like two months later, it came back to me. And then I went back to the post office and tried to send it again. And all the computers were down. <laughs> ben Gibbard was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> and then I went back and this time they finally took it. And I was just like, this is either going to get lost. It's going to reach our patron or it's going to come back to me again. And lo and behold, Norway took the box. And now we have another <laughs> playmat in northern europe and in the beautiful scandinavia thank you norwegian postal service we are also of course brought to you by mana traders if you use sign up code the dive down 15 right that's the new one that's right the dive down 15 funnily enough not only gets you 10 percent off that's your, no longer accurate dive down 15 <laughs> the, the dive down 15 meaning actually 10 because uh mana traders apparently has adjusted their promotional codes for everyone across the board uh so now it's only 10 percent off your first two months but i mean it's only a couple bucks you know it's still cool it's still 10 percent off you still help us out we they know that you came through us and it helps our relationship with mana traders I love using mana traders. I used them again this week. I was reminded why I love them because one, they, I keep decks for like three weeks and they never complain. Yes. And then they immediately give me new cards foolishly <laughs> that I can hold on for another three weeks. Uh, they're the best. They have everything you need. They seem like they, and you know, as, as you gain more months of loyalty, you get cards more immediately. Like you can access cards like the day they came out. They have loyalty bonuses, all that kind of good stuff. So thanks, mana traders. Uh, again, that's sign up code, the dive down 15. And of course, we are allegedly the official podcast of the Nerd Rage series. You can take our word for it. Nerd Rage tweeted a confirmation to say as much. So we are what I think is called Twitter official. Now that's that's thing, right. right. That's right. Yeah, we got a blue check now. Oh, I meant I meant our relationship status is updated. Well, I, yeah. I, I understand, but we got one just you know gratis. <sighs> yeah. I mean, we said it's it's complicated because it's still kind of you know new, but but we're optimistic about this. This one's. Going all the way. That's right. So it means a couple of things for you, the listener. First, you can get a discount on some actual physical paper cards when you shop from Nerd Rage Gaming. If you use coupon code DIVE8, the word DIVE and the number 8, you'll get 8% off your order over at Nerd Rage. And of course, there is another Nerd Rage trial coming up at the end of this month in beautiful Mundelein, Illinois, the city of dreams. 
weekend of July 30th. Signups are still going on. The main event, the Modern 10K, only has 85 of the 300 max seats available. And in case you missed the announcement, this 10K trial is also going to be an RCQ. So the winner of the trial gets a ton of money, fame, notoriety, and they get an invite to DreamHack Atlanta's Pioneer main event. Nice. And if you can't make it to the Saturday RCQ, there's going to be another modern RCQ the very next Sunday, July 31st, also in Mundelein. This one starts at 2.30 in the afternoon. It's not going to be a big main event. This one's only limited to 64 players. And registration for this event, on-site only, single elimination. The stakes are high. An entire weekend of modern regional championship qualifiers. Of course, you can even play in the Sunday Legacy 5K. But we're not talking about that. We're not, we're not legacy players. A single elimination 64-player tournament? That's hilarious and awesome. That's so fun. You just, you know, right away. You know, right away if you made it or not. You're just in Time to go house. home. Yep. That's in Time that's to get uh, Italian beef. Interesting structure there. Yeah. That's awesome. And then, you know, there's a chance you might see some people from the dive down there at the Mundelein on Saturday the 30th. So uh, we will keep you posted on that. Next week, our episode is probably going to contain, is going to contain some previews for that tournament. We will talk about the status of the leaderboard, what kind of decks we expect to see, who we think might be showing up with what. We might wildly speculate, or we might just talk about current modern meta to try to give you a sense of what you might want to pick for that tournament if you're going. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I guess we actually have a little bit of a breakdown, and it's just sort of a preview, not really a preview, a post view of Stanislav, you participated in an RCQ this weekend, right? That's true. I did. I fired off a second bullet. This is my. This is two modern RCQs in a row, guys. I played at GameStorm Lamont. Oh man, I miss GameStorm. That was my store when I lived in the Southwest Burbs. This was my first time playing there. This is my second time stepping foot in there, and I was truly, genuinely impressed with that shop. It was a really great shop, really well run oh, tournament, good. good crowd. Um, I played Merc Tide. I finished 2-3-1. Ooh. So 231st, not bad. Basically. Can I give you guys a really quick tournament report? Some, some I would love it. Yeah, let's hear it. Scoops. All right. Let's so hear what you I, think about Murktide. Yeah, so I started the day at 2-0. I beat, I beat Living End round one. I beat Grixis Shadow round two. And I was flying high. Let me tell you, feeling real good about myself. I was playing well, too. The Grixis Shadow match was one of the last matches of that round. So I had a crowd watching me. And I just, I played it beautifully. Let me tell you. Wow. And good thing I have my dive down play mat too. So I didn't really embarrass myself. Did you get out the other play mat later or no? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Once I started losing, I started using the, uh, the faithless brewing play mat. JK, JK. Um, okay. Round three though, I get paired against an opponent playing a foiled out elves deck. No, not like this. Crushed oh, me. No. Oh, just no. absolutely destroyed me. I honestly, I kind of just felt like elves is good against Murktide because it's, Point removal is not, it just overwhelmed your point removal kind of, and, and they have a zillion blockers for Ragavan. Exactly. Yeah. They just went really wide and then eventually just like double uh, Shaman of the Pact me. Mm. Um, it was hard. It was really hard. And, and then they could also basically deal with my removal by playing Realm Walker and just future sighted elves off the top of their, off the top of their library. So it, sure. it, it seriously wasn't close. Um, after that, I get, Paired against uh, another Murktide player, and I lost the mirror, which is actually just one of my least favorite games to play. I hate Murktide mirrors. People will talk about how fun and grindy they are. They're grindy as heck and just so unfun for me. I mean, you pick the worst possible deck if you don't like mirrors. I know. I yeah, know. as it turns out. And I was trying to practice the mirror, too. I was working with Dom Harvey on it a little bit, and it's just... The problem that I was in is that I loved playing Murktide. And it was just like, I'm going to suffer through some mirror matches. Maybe I can outplay my opponents, hopefully get a little luckier than them, because I think that matters a lot in mirror matches too. And it was not the case. Um, in round five, I got paired against a foil Jund player. And we got a draw. That's where my draw came from. Mm. We went to time <laughs> and could not decide, find a decisive winner. I kind of think I was ahead, but... That's neither here nor Don't there. Don't we all? That's neither here nor there. So you're two, two, and one at this point, and you're kind of feeling bumming a little bit, but also kind of like okay, right? So the the reason I kept going was was twofold. One, 
a buddy of mine was undefeated in the Swiss. Oh. I was running really hot. Also, this tournament's like an hour away from my house. So I was just mm-hmm. like, I'm really far away. We did not carpool, but it's like, my buddy's here doing well. I kind of want to cheer them on. Plus, the tournament's really far. And also, prize support extended beyond type, top eight. Yeah. So I figured if I can finish with at least an X2 record, I might still get some you know, money for my troubles. Yeah. I'm a big fan of your friend, by the way. I didn't mean to go, ugh, but I also know that your friend plays Urza, and that yeah. annoys me, but he is a nice person. Yeah, shout out, shout out to Dr. Martin, who finished in fourth place, actually. Wow. Um, Great job, Martin. Yeah, finally, sixth round, I got paired against the Mirror again, and in another grindy match, um, I could not pull through. I think in both of my Mirror matches, we went to game three, definitely in the last one, but... That's neither here nor there. Um, I also want to say I got to meet a fan of the dive down. Someone recognized my play mat. So shout out Brandon, who also told me that he likes Ween. And I guess we were at the same Ween concert. So Mm. Ween is back on the dive down, whether you like it or not. Dave and Shane. I don't, but that's okay. Um, I don't know what they sound like. (laughs) They sound like a lot of stuff. Yeah. All right. So here's Weird Al mostly. Parting thoughts. And that's not true at all. They're I know. Not, it's not true. Not parody I just musicians. Said that. I know. You fool. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So, guys, I think I, in the end, after two weeks of playing Merktide in these modern RCQs, I've realized that a full day, five to six rounds of Merktide, especially when it involves mirror matches, is just too mentally taxing for me to really enjoy it long to enjoy, it's too mentally taxing for me to enjoy to keep doing that if if and when I continue to play modern RCQs. Um, at least did, did you not hydrate? <laughs> did, did, did you not did, did you not have a caffeine and cliff bar? Oh, so I can't find caffeine and cliff bars anymore, but I, I do eat a cliff bar after every single round. Not, did they get not like a joke. Uh, I heard they've been I heard they've been denied by the uh, yeah, by the food FDA has said no, that is too good. <laughs> caffeine and cliff bars are too powerful for this world. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just eating regular Cliff Bars, um, and I'm drinking macro water supplements. I tell you Mm -hmm. what, like the biggest bottles of water I can get my hands on. Um, It doesn't help when you have to think about counter magic mirrors forever, though. It's not not enough. No, I I hear you, Stan. Like, that's... I'm curious if it's like a practice thing where it's just like your decisions are made before you're making the decisions. Do you know what I mean? Where like you're literally playing dozens and dozens of matches in preparation for an event like this. And then you just sort of like are operating much more intuitively and like not thinking as much, but like, I feel like to get to that point takes like a a mentality that I've almost never had. And if I tried to do that, then I just fail. Yeah. I mean, I will say this, the matches that I won were against decks that I had a pretty good plan ahead of the tournament. Like I knew exactly how I'm sideboarding against Living End. I knew exactly how I'm sideboarding against Grixis Shadow. And I had a sense for how to sideboard against Murktide. But mirror matches, I think people largely agree, are kind of like a crapshoot and who gets better draws. Um, and being more prepared for the mirror is important. But sometimes, like, you know, Murktide being this, like, tempo control deck, like, sometimes your opponent has all counter spells and you're playing a, a plan that's really vulnerable to that. Or vice versa, you have a handful of removal spells and they don't play any Ragavans. They sided out some of their threats. So a lot has to go right. And I think you have to walk this very tight rope to find like the exact perfect moment to like tap out for spells. And sometimes you get it wrong. And I think that's what happened to me a lot. And I'm not discouraged. I may be discouraged from playing Merktide and RCQs, but... I've been having a lot of fun playing Paper Modern. Just like That's good. massively fun times. In fact, I've intentionally only played Modern RCQs. I have no intention to play a Pioneer RCQ. And even though I'm playing for a chance to participate in DreamHack Atlanta, which is a Pioneer main event, the fact that I get to maybe test my might in these modern paper tournaments makes up for the fact that I don't really enjoy Pioneer right now. And I'll really only like cross the pioneer bridge when i absolutely have to that's weird i haven't heard you mention that yeah before <laughs> uh, I, I thought known mo- known pioneer lover stan changes no no it's heel. explorer I, you know I'm a, I'm a big explorer guy 
Yeah. All right. So can we go back to one thing that you said and kind of slip by there real quick? Sure. Yeah. You've been a Murktide main for, I feel like, three months, I want to say, two, three months, kind of pretty Murktide main. Are sure. you willing to share what you're thinking about going to next? Or can I guess what you're thinking about going to? Please, guys, guess. Are you going to go back to Crashcade? That's that's an option. Shane, do you have guesses? Burn is my other option, is my other guess for you. Dave, I'm impressed. You actually, you, you got my two. Wow. I'm holding in my hand. So Burn is the real surprise for me, but I just saw you slip by a comment on the Discord the other day about how you thought Burn was a reasonable option that yes. made me stop and go, is it, Stan, <laughs> someone who I've never heard say anything interesting about Burn before or interested about Burn? Yeah, no. I've never, you say, I've never heard you say I've lots never heard of interesting no. things. Stan's never said anything interesting about Burn either. Um, no, I, I have been liking Burn lately. I've been just like, I played a, a Burn League after my Merktide day and just like snapped off a quick 4-1. Chicago's um, real Burn meta. I, yeah, I, I, I think Burn is actually fine um, against a lot of the decks that are popular right now. Like, I think it's fine against Merktide, and I think I'm, I know how to navigate the four-color matchup. I'm actually undefeated against four-color in leagues with Burn. That's good. I mean, Burn destroyed me on the deck that I selected for this week, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, Burn's really good. I mean, it's always like it's always solid. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think, and I think the meta game is in is in particular places. It gets you know a little bit better, and I think it's always going to be a decent choice, right? Like, I don't. We're not. We're not in a modern meta game where it's like, oh no, I got to deal with Heliod. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, the thing is, like, I think Burn is more or less solid at different times, and the reason why I actually like Burn now in particular is because like. No one's packing ley lines of sanctity. You know, people are planning to beat burn with just like the counter magic and murktide decks, griefs, I think, and, and force of negations in some of these cascade decks. Life gain. Um, or life gain with Omnath, yeah. And I don't or Chalice of the Void is the other one. And I don't think people are necessarily like trying to, you know, devote like lights like, out it. Yeah, devote lights out a lights out package against burn. And I think that makes for a really good opportunity to actually just like get under enough fools. Also, um, I think it's a good thing to just change, especially since you're aspirate. You know, you you have competitive aspirations for sure, and you you put a lot of effort in the last year to improving your Magic game. And I think if you want to take a minute and play an aggro deck instead of playing a you know tempo control deck for a minute, the next time you go in paper, that could be just be an even more fun experience. Just to change it up a little bit because you're you're already enjoying it. There's no reason to keep grinding if you feel like it's becoming a grind. Like just don't don't do that. You know. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I have two weeks to decide and it's basically just going to determine like how I feel rhinos is too. The the only reason why I'm still considering rhinos is it is another deck that I really love to play. And I think it's actually just like better equipped as a deck to beat hate cards. That's kind of contributes to its power in general, like having access to really powerful free spells out of the sideboard or, you know, Prismari commands main or uh-huh. uh, brazen borrowers what have you just being able to like both do a powerful linear thing or if i have to outplay with a reactionary plan um i kind of like the way that the deck pivots between those two positions and that's why burn and, and rhinos are basically my two picks right now yeah i uh i guess the thing that i would ask real quick is how is the was the was the room stacked in chicago again like it was yes. last week when you were at evanston was it just like unbelievable yes yeah that's cool. Yeah. Zoe was there again, right? Yeah. Th- there are other people whom I recognized from playing in Chicago, which is to say that I think Game Storm and, and Shane, that that was your shop, so maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like Game Storm has a positive reputation among competitive paper players in the Chicago area. So when a modern RCQ rolls around, like a lot of really good players are going to go there because yeah. they know they're going to have a good time. And like hot sauce is not far at least where i remember hot sauce being and like hot sauce has some absurd players so like if they if they rolled in that's not going to help you out either yeah awesome well rcq season is is continuing to go on and you know i there is a little bit of people starting to talk on twitter i think about realizing that the number of seats are limited like so i think that the competition at these might get a little bit more fierce as time goes on but you know, I think it goes to the end of August. So there's still a number of weeks, you know, there's probably five weeks of tournaments left, maybe six. And so 
there's a lot of room to do more tournaments, but it'll be interesting to see who actually qualifies and who doesn't from the people who are the really, really big grinders that are around. Since I don't believe that there's a way to get like a special invite or a hall of fame invite or whatever to this, it'll just kind of be like whoever makes it makes it, which is cool. Mm -hmm. Um, with that in mind, one little story I wanted to share with everybody just by way of congratulations is, you know, last week was also, or the last few weeks has also been store championships. We've all seen those dark confidant promos floating around and Archmage's charmed promos floating around. And this weekend at the Mox boarding house in Portland, we actually had a dive down versus dive down mirror in the finals. Yes. For that. So the tournament to two, two of our discord stalwarts, people that Shane has met in real life. Yeah, you've met, met both of, both I, Aaron Chase and Aaron, multiple right? times. Yeah, multiple yeah. Times. we hung out with them in Vegas. Yeah, I have not met these two yet, but I have. I played D and D with Jason for a little bit, and uh, just want to say congrats to you two. It was a Omnath Cascade versus Yogmoth Mirror. Aaron is well known Yogmoth person. We talked about him before on the show, but uh, yeah, Jason, Jason won it all on Omnath Cascade Glimpse. Love it, love it. Yeah, it's and uh, you know they take so much joy in their magic. I'm so I'm so happy to see them doing well. Jason got to win with a deck that he you know has been champion. Aaron got to go to the finals on a deck that he's been playing for a long time. So it's just cool to see uh, these folks keep doing what they're doing and playing decks they like to play and winning with them. And and I think we deserve some credit for their success. You know, <laughs> being members of the Dev Donation clearly makes you qualified for store championship finals. It's Head on over more. to patreon.com slash the dive down. Yes, they've been patrons for at least two years. So if you want to catch up, you need to be thinking long term here. Okay, why don't we take a little break here? And then we're going to come back and get into the decks that we that we chose uh, to talk about in this Leave Believe Heave Modern Edition, Modern Rogues Edition, let's call it. Stay with us. Bonjour. Fellow dive downers. Aloha. Wrong direction, Shane. Ah, oh, poop. I don't know if you guys heard the news, but our friends over at Barrister and Man are expanding across the pond. That's right. They're now shipping to Europe. Oh, heck yeah. That's great. And now I mean, we have a real really... in, in Europe. <laughs> beyond beyond venue? How do you yeah, say that? I always see that word written. I've never heard it said. I don't know how to say it. Bain bone anyway uh, we have you know there's plenty of listeners and non-listeners alike that live in europe i think uh so i would venture that we, there's more non-listeners than listeners that live in europe just a guess uh i don't like that ratio but i'm sure there's plenty of people who've been like well this stuff sounds cool but i don't live in the united states so i'm just gonna skip past this little ad drop so don't don't do that because you can now order barrister and man products and is it all of EU, Stanislav? From the looks of it, it appears to be mostly in the UK for now via a retail partner known as Slick Boys, which you can find over in the retailer section of barristerandman.com. Aren't we the original Slick Boys? That was the original name of this podcast. That's right. So yeah, our friends in the United Kingdom. Oh, actually, you know what it says here? UK EU. I think EU stands for European Union. Sure does. That's, that's what I've heard. It used to stand for something. Let, let's decide on Barrister and Man's behalf. All of EU. It's it's settled. Check them out. Go to if you want to find it. If you if you're in the EU or the UK, and you want to find out about where to get Barrister and Man, go to the retailers tab on their website, and go to Slick Boys. Uh, it's under there for UK EU. Now, there won't be a place to enter our code on the Slick Boys website, but if you want to buy this way and you want to help us out, shoot Will a note on Twitter or Instagram and tell him you found us, you found it from the dive down. And as far as everybody else goes, they still got great products. I'm still loving La Vanille. Um, Will has also updated a whole lot of the packaging, it looks like right now. If you want to check out the a little bit of an updated look and feel to everything, it's looking very cool. It looks like Electric Mayhem has dropped. It looks like Artic has dropped. Electric Mayhem sounds really good. I kind of want to do it's like a bunch of like cool fruits and rosewood and white musk. Like I'm actually gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna buy a little jar of that before it's gone. I like the I keep missing these seasonals, honestly. I actually recently used a barrister and man cologne. Wife and I got a babysitter on Friday night. We went out for Ooh. date night. A nice wow. little meal. 
at a bistro, and I used Just Right for a Tuesday, which is the name of the cologne. Was it Tuesday? No, it was a Friday, but it was the... <sighs> It was a perfect light touch, not too overpowering. I smelled fresh. Really loved it. So and if, if if your wife likes it and you like it, then I know it's it's got a it casts a wide net of of uh, applicability. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sweet. Very applicable awesome. cologne. Cool. Uh, yeah. So again, if you want to help us out, use code the dive down fifteen when you purchase from Barrister and Man. Gets you fifteen percent off your first order from them. And it lets you know that you came through us, and we appreciate it. So, Dave, you you promised us in the in the intro, you promised us some some patented Dave Harbarger negativity. <laughs> you <laughs> you promised us some some hot takes on cool decks. You promised to tell us that an actual good deck is bad. Uh huh. Whoa, whoa. Which one's that? But um. So I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm. I'm all ears. So what we're doing again is you know another one in our series of hey these guys play three different decks and talk about them and then rate them on some scale. Uh, and that's really you know it's 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 fun for us. Hopefully it's fun for you all because there's a lot of decks in modern and they're not all the ones that are like fifteen percent of the meta. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as much as we talked about consolidation of the meta when Zach was on last week and all that kind of stuff, look. I just keep seeing people on Twitter that are like, I won my RCQ with this deck and I won with that deck. And I know that's kind of anecdotal, but as much as I agree with, with Zach too, if you're going to go to an energy trial and you're on the leaderboard and you have a real shot or you're a fan of that stuff and you want to know how those decks work, but you watch it. Yeah. The metagame is going to be highly made up of, of those super competitive decks, but there is a ton of stuff still out here to be played, to be played against in the, uh, cues, and there were three decks in particular that caught our attention this week. The foil elves deck that I played against at my RCQ this weekend made it to top eight. Yeah. You're going to run into the people who have mastered this archetype, got the most expensive versions of these cards, and they're going to get you by surprise. And maybe you can too with some of the decks that we're talking about today. Probably yeah, not d- the one that I'm about to talk <laughs> about, but we'll see. Yeah, Dave, what, what caught you by surprise this week? Tell us about what you played. Well, you guys know how much I love being negative. I actually yes, feel like one thing, day of negativity. I'm pretty <laughs> I'm trying to be very positive. So this week I was taken for a second ride. I'm gonna call it. I'm just gonna say it like that. I was taken for a ride again by the seemingly reemergence of an archetype that I messed around with earlier this spring, known as indomitable creativity or indomitable creativity, depending on how you want to say it. Uh, but yeah. I took another look at that deck after being inspired to look into it uh, because Gabe and Seif top uh, got in the finals of Modern Challenge a couple weeks ago with a new-ish build of it. Now, why would I do that, even as a result of this? Well, (laughs) I already knew that I had kind of a tough time with creativity. The last time I played Paper Modern, maybe not the last time because we went to Dallas since the last time I went to a store, uh, I played creativity, sleeved it up. It was terrible. Thought I would never do it again. Then I saw Gabe's list. That was interesting to me because it's basically a teamer list. It's not trying to jam Teferi 3. It's not trying to jam in Prismatic Endings. What it has instead is a couple of different cards that I thought caught my eye in particular. In particular, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, which is one of my favorite cards to play right now that I feel like has sort of not found a home in modern in a really consistent way quite yet quite yet even though it's a card that i think is pretty powerful and so what uh, so that's the deck you know the deck is basically the original one was kind of like a i felt like it was kind of like a bad four color control deck you had red and six you had to ferry three you don't have any of the other cards to attack with the rest of your deck is all about a little bit of interaction and getting to uh indomitable creativity and then doing your thing and getting archon and cruelty into play yeah, Dave, what is the what is the thing? So in Dumbo Creativity is just what? Like it just basically transmogrifies more or less? Yep. It's a polymorph combo deck, essentially, right? Of some kind. These are all poly descendants of the card polymorph in one way or another, where you destroy something and then take cards off the top of your deck until you hit a target in your deck that's a creature, and then you put that creature directly in the battlefield. Uh, Indominable Creativity lets you target artifacts and or creatures. It's an X spell where you can pay X then red, 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 and destroy X target artifacts under creatures. For each permanent destroyed this way, the controller reveals cards from the top. 
until an artifact or a creature card is revealed and exiles that card, then those players put those cards in the battlefield, shuffle the library. So Indomitable Creativity lets you do multiple targets, lets you target your own stuff, it lets you target your opponent's stuff, but mostly what you're trying to do, especially in modern lately, is go to basically polymorph yourself into uh, Archon of Cruelty from Modern Horizons 2. Modern Horizons 2 is a giant black creature. It's an Archon. Uh, that's why it's called Archon of Cruelty. And it's a 6-6 six, six flyer that says whenever Archon of Cruelty enters the battlefield or attacks, target opponent sacrifices a creature or planeswalker, discards a card, and loses a three life. You draw a card and gain three life. Yeah, this this card's very good. I've loved when I was playing some reanimator strategies. Like This card can definitely take over and close out a game pretty efficiently. Besides Unholy Heat. And maybe, maybe I'm getting out ahead of myself there. Yeah, well, we'll call it foreshadowing. Um, you also tend to have other targets like Sarah's... Uh, what's that one? Sarah's Avatar, Emissary. Sarah's Emissary. Emrakul is in these lists a lot of times in the sideboard of the list that I was playing. But the idea here is basically get yourself a board state where you can get a token, have Indomitable Creativity in your hand, target your token that's either a creature or an artifact token, depending on how your game is going, and get an Archon of Cruelty or an Emrakul into play. That's it. That's that's the deck. So what I thought was interesting about this new version is that, you know, the plan is simple, but the three main things that really unify that plan is three things, I think. One is you want to get to five mana as fast as possible to be able to indomitable creativity where X equals two. Okay, you don't really want to do X equals one because it's kind of putting too many eggs in a single basket where someone could kill your Archon or they could interfere and kill the token that you're trying to target with Indomitable Creativity and then your spell fizzles. So you want to try X equals two. If, you're, if you want to get really aggressive, you can do X equals one, but most cases you're doing X equals two. What that means is you also have to have two tokens in play to use as sacrifice fodder, right? So you have to generate tokens efficiently in the deck. And then the third thing you have to do is you have to actually draw the combo card because since it's essentially a one card combo with creativity, you have to efficiently get to the card itself. So I think the old deck, the four color deck that I was playing had some problems with doing those things consistently. You know, there were pieces of interaction that helped you control the game because it would play prismatic, it was playing prismatic ending. Sometimes you were playing Path to Exile. This deck plays Lightning Bolt. The earlier four color deck that I was playing played Lightning Bolt. It had Teferi three to help bounce a threat. You have Ren and Six that can kill something occasionally. But I really felt like there was a lot of stuff, a lot of times when I was playing that four color deck where I guess it's even a five color deck really because Archon's a black card, but whatever. But you know, you would kind of get to a point where you're like, well, I have Ren and Six, I'm playing all my lands, and I have Teferi three. And I'm doing my thing, and I have a uh, I have a dwarf token, and now I can't do anything else, and that's it. And then you're like, you're not doing anything powerful. There's not a great way to really get through your deck, or maybe enough critical mass of effects that get you through your deck. And so I kind of felt like the deck just ran out of gas a lot all the times that I was playing it. So the trade-off to this new list is let's find some cards that help us do the three things that I outlined. In a, in a more consistent way, in a more powerful way, and cut white out of the deck. So you lose to Fairy 3, you lose um, Prismatic Ending, Path to Exile, powerful white sideboard cards, but what you gain, essentially, is, as I mentioned, you gain Fable of the Mirror Breaker, which I really like and I think is a cool card, and you gain Explore. <laughs> now, Explore was not the card that I was kind of expecting to see in a deck like this, but it does make the mana base simpler, and, I mean, it's a ramp spell, so... And it's a cantrip. And it's a cantrip. And so we're, all of those things help you in different ways. So if you're thinking about how this list can help you get to five mana ahead of curve, number one, how does it improve that? Well, the old deck didn't get to five mana on four a ton because Prismari Command was really the only way you could really ramp ramp. You could make a treasure token. You know, occasionally these, these lists ran strike it rich, which is like, you know, really high risk, high reward. You're really all in on combo there. But now what this deck can do in line with this plan is you can explore to play an extra land quite frequently. And you can fable where if you play a fable on three and then you attack with the token, if it survives on four, you get a treasure token. And then you're, you know, you're on five mana on turn four, which is kind of where you want to be. 
So you have a lot more plays, I think, where you end up on four mana on turn three or five mana on turn four. And I think that those are decent things to be able to do. Um, so that seems like a good start. Having tokens as sack fodder, like how to do that better? Well, this is all about Fable, I think, in the new list, because Fable makes two creatures, right? In addition to the other stuff that it does, it makes the 2-2. The 2-2 makes tokens, and then it also flips at the end into another creature that you can target with a creativity if you want to. So, Dave, I kind of always assumed that this deck was kind of about doing some early token creation and then casting Indomitable Creativity kind of as quickly as possible with maybe some counter magic backup. And I feel like with this setup, it's 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 much more of a, a, a long-term kind of setup, right? Just to get through all the turns for the no, saga. No, because you want to try to play Saga on three. Because Saga sets you up for yeah. creativity targeting your goblin on four, right? Or... It sets you up with um, being able to do the draw to discard to discard to draw to on turn five, right? So it's I don't think the earlier decks were trying to cast creativity on four. They were trying, but it wasn't trying to do it quite as consistently. You know, like I said, you had strike it rich. You could you can't really prismari command on three to get a fourth mana on turn four because then you've spent. The mana, to, you know, you've spent your third turn casting Prismari Command. So I think that Explorer actually does a lot to make it more possible to cast this a couple of turns earlier than you can in some of the other builds. So I think this one is actually a little more in on doing it without backup than um, some of the other ones where what you were really trying to do in the five color list is get Teferi online so that people can't mess with you when you're trying to cast Creativity. And so they have to deal with Teferi in order for... Um, to keep from getting killed by Archon, basically. So it's a little more all-in on combo, in my mind, but it also grinds a little bit better because there's more card selection and more card draw, things like that. However, to go back to Fable in the context of having more tokens, Fable makes a ton of tokens. And creatures, quote-unquote, makes targets for creativity in a single card, which is, is really good because at the you know when you think about the third leg of that stool I was talking about, you want to draw your combo card more, and really, Fable is the glue there because of that Season Pyromancer ability on the, on the second chapter of the saga, which is slower. You don't always want to count on that. But now you have Prismari Command that does that move. You have Fable that does that move. You have extra cantrips and Explore that helps you draw extra cards. You can even go Hard Evidence and sacrifice the clue token if you want to to draw a card if you have to. So there's more, a lot more cards in the deck that are on plan with the deck that help you draw more cards as well, right? I mean, Explore and Fable the Mirror Breaker in particular. And it's sort of like, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of discussion in the Discord about creativity this week because there's a lot of people who like to play creative in the Discord. God help them, I don't, I don't know why. But, <laughs> um, you know, one thing that was pointed out to me by Maria in our Discord, who's kind of a resident judge, and extremely like, well, good, good writer, great thinker on magic. She was kind of saying, you know, e expressive iteration doesn't really work great in this deck because you don't want to spend turn two or turn three doing that. You do want to try to set yourself up into casting creativity as early as possible. And EI doesn't really help you with that. It helps you recover later and have better, have better uh, selection. But all these other cards actually do help you cast creativity faster. So... I, I kind of see how the plan works here with these kind of like medium cards like Explorer. Okay, so I told you about the deck. I told you about the cards that were different in the deck. I think that logically speaking, oh, last thing is these lists play Transmogrify too. So you have a fifth creativity basically in your deck, which ups your percentage to draw the card a little bit as well. So they have one Transmogrify, four creativities. Transmogrify is not as good as creativity, but it certainly um, does the job occasionally when you want to just get one Archon out. I want to make sure you're doing something. But I think all these changes make a ton of rational sense. And I think it's really good, like reasoned thinking and brewing behind how this deck, this version of this deck works. Clearly it works for, for Gabe, but I have to say, I really felt bad losing Teferi with this. And I already thought that this deck wasn't great when it had Teferi in it. <laughs> so this was kind of bad. Like this was a bad deck for me. I did not enjoy this. I don't think it's particularly good, especially for hopping in a magic 
leagues with, for example. So what what was happening? I was losing. That's what was happening. Well, why were you losing, Dave? Let's think about the 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 what is it the ex- the result, yeah. not the results. Yeah, what was think happening? About the, yeah. the decisions. Uh, I exactly. mean, some of it is like there there is some trickiness to this deck. I mean, I'm not really used to playing Explore, so there were there was one game I remember for sure where like I should have dropped Explore on two, not even thought about it. Instead, I got trickier, played Ren and Six on two to try to get a Bosiju plan up and going because i was playing against an artifact deck and i think it probably lost me the game because i should have just gone all in on the combo instead however this plan is so easy to to just disrupt like you have some counter magic in your sideboard you have two spell pierce in the main but it is really really easy to kill the creature that is being targeted Target it with with removal that's like uncounterable. For example, if somebody wants to hit your clue token with a Boseju or something like that, it's really easy to counter creativity because sometimes you're just in a point where you have to go all in and try to try to go for creativity without counter spell backup. As you said, Shane, you know you want to be able to to maybe have spell pierce up if you're against a deck that has spell pierces, but sometimes that doesn't matter. And then also, Archons aren't like completely resilient to and you've talked about this before on the show too they die on and unholy heat is especially popular right now it's in the four color decks where it's sort of rotated a little bit out of those decks occasionally in the past so if you go up against a four color omnath deck which supposedly this deck has a good matchup against they have solitude which you can't counter with any of your your counter spells there's no way to protect an archon from solitude and they have unholy heat which you might be able to counter but also they can just sneak it in for for one mana when maybe you don't have access to to cover your card or they have so much mana that spell pierce doesn't even matter so this might be a stupid question but why are we picking archon of cruelty like of all cards like why is it archon like this is this is not uh this doesn't have to be a non-legendary creature card like it does have to be for persist or uh, you know unmarked grave so it's just like, well, it's Archon's not just well, closing the door. For one thing, it's because you want to try to get two of them at once. And so it really shouldn't be a legendary card because you want to do X equals two as much as you can so that you can get the six life, get the six damage, draw two cards, make them discard two cards. Like all of that makes makes sense to me and from that sense. But I do think that this might just be the creature with the most kind of like value triggers on it. It basically is trying to cast. I mean, really what you're trying to do is cast cruel ultimatum. <laughs> like you're kind of like, okay, I'm going to tutor for cruel ultimatum that, that does the cruel ultimatum thing. And then because they're creatures, I get to do them again the next turn when I attack with them and I get to block with them and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, having one stick is great, but like, you know, it's, it's not, it's not that sticky sometimes. Yeah. So at any rate, that's how they can disrupt their plan. And then structurally, this deck is really greedy with on mana. You know, you need everything to be a mountain, basically, so that when you want to go fetch up a Dwarven Mine, because the A plan is really like, I'm going to build up my board, I'm going to get Ren and Six going, I'm going to do some interacting, and then w- when it's time, when I have three mountains and a fetch land, I'm going to go at the end of your turn or maybe even main phase on my turn, if I feel like you're tapped out, I'm going to go fetch a Dwarven Mine, I'm going to get my token, then I'm going to use that land, and I'm going to tap, cast creativity on that token, and then I'm going to get my Archon or on two tokens. But because of that, the way that it works, there's there's basically only one target in here that comes into play untapped without shocking you. And so it's almost like playing Death Shadow mana in some ways because early in the game when you're really setting yourself up and you need to be able to cast a two drop for example you want to cast run and six you're shocking yourself twice almost every time because you're not fetching basic mountain a ton i don't think because there's so many different colors that you want to have in here you need the green you need the blue and so and sometimes you even want to go and get the black so that you can potentially cast archon of cruelty later there is one blood crypt in this deck that is sort of like you go get it as a last resort basically so it makes you die to aggro lists because you take so much damage from your from your lands because a lot of times you don't want to go get Dwarven Mine yet and get your creature killed. You just want to go get your Steam Vents and your Stomping Grounds and that stuff to kind of get your, your deck really going. So, you know, I really just kind of felt like it's not happening yet. For me, anyway, it's not happening. And I even went into our Discord last night and was like, okay, who wants to help me understand how to, how to get better at, at, at uh, creativity? 
this honestly just looks like a the same game plan of like the reanimator strategies that popped up post MH2, just like different hoops that you're jumping through to get to the same result. We're just like, hey, I, I'm I'm doing the setup. I'm hoping that you're not going to have interaction that makes my setup not function any longer. And in the case of reanimator, it's like graveyard hate, counter magic. In this, it's creature removal, counter magic, things like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I felt pretty good after the first league. I started out 2-1, and then I lost two matches, and I was like, okay, like a 2-3, all right, maybe I'll do better. And then last night, it was just like, oh, five. I lost to Hardened Scales. I lost to Burn twice. I lost to four color, uh, four color Omnath, and I lost to, I think I lost to Etron as well. And it was brutal. And especially for a deck where I have Buseju and Renin 6, and it just wasn't fast enough to deal with what was going on with the um, with the colorless decks. Um, yeah, you can't really target that many. You can target a lot of things in Etron or this Etron control deck that's sort of floating around right now with Beseju, but it wasn't enough to really stop the Reality Smashers from killing me, essentially. Um, so, I don't know. What do you all think about this deck? Uh, I mean, you you said your part, Stan. Thoughts. So the the thing that I find particularly interesting about it is that every time someone does well with this deck, it's with a slightly different version. Yes. And I wonder whether maybe you just played the wrong version for the week and people got wind of what Nasif's deck is up to and just had a better plan against it. Especially if you had a better plan against someone who wasn't piloting it optimally yeah. and were able to exploit your inefficiencies. Yeah, could be. I mean, I do think that there's something here still, and there's a lot of people, like I said, who are in the nation who love this deck. A friend of the show, Zach Ryle, loves creativity and has long enjoyed this. It's just something I've never really found my my footing for. You know, and part of the reason I want to try it is because so many people were at different points of time have been like, oh, it's like playing Splinter Twin. And I'm like, is it though? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is it like playing Splinter Twin? I, I don't know. So for me, I'm going to go to the rating so that you guys can talk about decks that you actually liked here. Uh, this is pretty much a heave for me right now. I'm not going to candy coat it. Maybe other people really <laughs> like it. You know, there are people in our Discord who like to play Jeskai versions and they like to play Grixis versions. And I think that that's all well and good. I think there is something to this archetype, but it's just, I just don't think like it's there yet. Hmm. Juice, squeeze, cost benefit analysis, etc. Yep. Yep. I was looking at creativity as well. Not, not necessarily for myself, but as this deck that has been seeing a lot of success lately and is getting like picked up by really good players and trying to understand, improve my understanding at least of what the appeal is. Yeah. But I think the appeal is that it's supposed to be sort of like a combo control deck that can go bigger than Omnath. But Omnath actually has a lot of things that kill Archon. So that was a little bit confounding to me, you know, when yeah. I when I played it. Now right. my and you list, can't spell Pierce of Solitude. Right. You can't spell Pierce of Solitude. Exactly. All That's that what mom always said. Yeah. My mom always told me. But you can play a dress down. There's there's one dress down on the sideboard. That helps a little bit, but this this deck is so mana hungry that you're just tapped out a lot. Like it's it's very reminiscent of like a tap tap out control mm -hmm, deck. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe I'm playing it wrong in that style, but at the same time, like you can't sit around forever and then let them build a board. So it is about finding that right turn. But I don't know. I just think that maybe this isn't for me as much as I'd like it to be fun. It's not been fun for me. <laughs> well, it's okay, bud. There's a lot of other decks out there. Yeah, that you like playing. But uh, I I played a deck I, I kind of like Dave I kind of liked it but it's not that it's not it's not that different from other decks that I have liked in the past so I played this is it's it's like Etron but it's like <laughs> it's like Etron Prison sort of strategy it's like it's like a interesting hybrid of the two and um, if you have have seen variations of this deck in the past that's probably from twitter user lori wawa and he seems they seem to be a seasoned player they win a lot more than i do as far back as august 2021 they seem to have been championing this style of deck uh they posted this saying people often ask me what would happen if etron and golo stacks had a baby together uh and it is who who has asked that show me the receipts yeah i mean 
I, th- I think it might have been apocryphal. Um, but with Lori's deck is a lot of main deck and sideboard hate pieces like Pithing Needle, Ratchet Bomb, Bridges, Chalice of the Voids, etc., etc. And if this deck effectively looks to win the game like entirely with like Karn the Great Creator and Thought Not Seer, uh, I don't really know how this deck wins most of the time because it doesn't even have Walking Ballistas anywhere to ping down the opponent through ensnaring bridges. But what what, what Lori states is I'm gonna I don't actually this person's name is really hard to find, so I'm going to call them Lori, but I don't know what their actual name is, so forgive me. But this person has done were they in a mox and also top yeah. eight in a paper tournament not too yeah, long? They've done I mean, a lot a of ago? work. They they is, seem like they're like a legacy stacks type player. They every every deck list they post is colorless. Yeah, this is the person. In case you're trying to picture them, their picture on their Twitter bio is someone who basically has a beard that looks all, the same gray color as mine, and uh, looks to be in our age demographic. He's an shape. Xer. Yeah, they're an Xer. So, yeah. but what what Lori states is that there's there's a card I want to talk about now. And it's possessed portal as a great way to actually close out games. Cause someone asked the same question I do. It's like, well, you don't have anything to kill the opponent and possessed portal is an eight mana artifact. If a player would draw a card, that player skips that draw instead at the beginning of each end step, each player sacrifices a permanent unless they discard a card. So what you can effectively do is once you have the opponent locked down enough, you can just be sort of gaining cards through things like your Karn, Every other turn can just sort of be picking something out of Exile or out of your sideboard. Uh, Mystic Forge is also getting letting you play cards off the top of your deck. And so your opponent can be drained of all resources, and they're just sacrificing permanents and not drawing cards. And then you eventually can just sacrifice your bridge and then smash in, I suppose, is one way to win the game. So if you really like doing something pretty mean, uh, there's an option there. Um, For all you and- people who miss uh, Mycosynth Lattice, huh? Yes. Kind of. uh, so notably, the deck was missing like Matter Reshaper, Reality Smasher, uh, but it's just kind of trying to stack the opponent out, you know, just tax, resource denial, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and make your opponent not have any fun. And so, Shane, you're asking, this deck is almost a year old now, why are you talking about it now? But I was reminded of it by Twitter user Bugra Alp, Alp, Alpinso, and that's a uh, Alp Inso MTG is their Twitter handle, and they called it a they control they called this deck Controlish Etron, which I think is fair, and stated it was very good against what they consider the top decks right now. And I'm always looking for a good Car in the Great Creator deck, and so I decided to dive in, see what I thought, and so this deck is kind of just secretly Etron, like it's it's not exactly, but it's not really leaning entirely on the stacks elements of Lori's build. But of course, in the sideboard, it has Karn the Great Creator main deck, and so the sideboard has a lot of the prison elements that makes Karn so incredible so often. And the general concept of this deck, in my opinion, is to bridge from the early game into the late game by using interaction and creature speed bumps while building your Tron mana engine. And then you sort of lock things down with Karn the Great Creator and the powerful sideboard cards you have access to with that. Uh, it noticeably, noticeably doesn't have a lot of sort of the huge mid-range aspects that Eldrazi Tron offers. It doesn't have Reality Smashers. It doesn't have Planeswalkers like Ugin the Ineffable or Karn Sign of Ur- Urza. And it really sort of has a lot more interaction that's teched against the current metagame. So it has four ofs of creatures that you'd expect, like Walking Ballista and Thought Not Seer. Uh, even as two Ulamogs, and maybe something you might not expect in the era of Modern Horizons 2, which is four matter reshapers. Uh, more about those later. Walking Ballista and Thought Nuts here, of course, are just shoe ins, right? They Ballista is your flexible removal option, or your giant creature, or your way to win under an uh, ensnaring bridge. Thought Nuts here on turn two or turn three gets you a 4 4 body that interacts with the opponent's hands. Matter reshaper is kind of like the butt of jokes, but I think here it serves a really particular purpose because it offers a blocker or eats a removal spell and replaces itself and then bridges you to your mid and late game. So it's like it's good enough as a blocker. It can be cast on turn two a lot of times, and it just kind of does another step along the way. And that's why this deck doesn't you know, run something like Reality Smasher, because it's not the end game you're building towards, I think. And Mattery Shaper is kind of actually more on plan. So sure, you can look at the creatures and just be like, okay, well, this is 
not necessarily on rate in today's modern. Uh, it's kind of ridiculous, but you know, casting it a turn early is helpful. Casting it when you, you have a, a Tron out and you can do like a four drop and a three drop works really nicely. Often, like I was often doing something like a Karn and a Shaper or a Thought Nazi or and a Shaper, so the the mana just sort of lines up well when you've made Tron. And then, uh, of course, as Karn the Great Creator is your Planeswalker because it does what you want it to do: tutor up artifacts stop your opponent's artifacts, all that kind of stuff. But here's where stuff gets a little more interesting, I think, and I and sort of looks at, like, tech. Like, here's the tech against the meta, and that's three Warping Whale, three Dismember, and two All is Dust, which is, of course, just kind of standard in these decks. But Warping Whale is really useful right now, I think. It can exile all sorts of creatures, like Ragavan, DRC, Swiss Spear, Shredders without counters on them yet, Random undying creatures get exiled, like Young Wolf or Strangled Geist. Can also counter sorcery spells. That's its second mode, uh, which is really useful for Cascade spells, like Living End or Crashing Footfalls. And then, of course, ramps you in a pinch if you need to. And then Dismember is your more your more painful but flexible removal against bigger creatures. You know, some Shredder grows a, f- a few times on you, and you got to Dismember it. And then all of Dust, all all this Dust is, of course, is your reasonable sweeper. Then we get to some artifacts, of course. Four Expedition Map, obviously. Four Relic of Progenitus, which is like, it's it's pretty heavy tech against some of the current meta, like Murktide decks or Living End decks or Yawgmoth. There's, I'm sure there's some things I'm forgetting about. There's all sorts of stuff that uses the graveyard all the time, right? And it's also a good cantrip. Yes, that's <laughs> that's that's the thing, right? It's like it's it draws you through your deck for kind of incidental value. So like whether or not you're using it one at a time with the tap or you pop it all at once, you're drawing another card, which can be good. And it also puts cards into exile for your card. Yes, 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 yes. That's that's something that I think people forget about, including myself, pretty often. Like all of the stuff you're exiling uh, allows you to like get that back eventually, which is why some of the other decks will play stuff like Serum Powder where you're sort of you're exiling cards that you have access to later on in the game and like you said Stan yeah like if you if you pop your graveyard and it has a bunch of useful artifacts in it you can then just get them back with your Karn again which can be really valuable and then there's two maze mind tomes which is surprisingly flexible surprisingly useful like it's only two mana it scries it draws it gains life eventually and all that kind of stuff is just incidental value in a deck like this and so that's kind of like the just those are the land. I mean, excuse me, those are the creatures and the spells and the planeswalkers that go into this deck. And then you know the mana base is probably what you expect, like for Temple, you know, all of the Urza lands, a couple Urza sagas for maybe tutoring up another relic or another expedition map or something like that, and making some artifact creatures. Um, some other interesting mana stuff that I liked was, you know, there's a lot of one-ofs that you can tutor up with map if you need, like Blast Zone or Cavern. Look, Blast Zone, you know, clears a lot of one mana, you know, more higher creatures. I used it really well against a uh, burn opponent that played a, one, a lot of one-drops at some point. Cavern of Souls against Counter Magic decks, Ghost Quarter, if you need to take care of something uh, annoying on the other side. It also just kind of works against decks that don't run a lot of basics. Like, I know that, like, Blue Living End for example, I think didn't have any mountains. And so I took care of like their one of their red sources and they were just had no access to red mana. That was really helpful. Cards like Urborg and Swamp and Wastes help you uh, with casting dismembers or getting kind of a, a basic when you need to. I also really liked also tech like Urborg. Tech against, well, yeah, go for it. Void Mirror. Void Mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was one of my favorite things in my league was where late in the game, my opponent plays a, a Void Mirror against me. And then the next turn, I just had been sandbagging this Urborg and I just drop it. And then I cast an Ulamog. And that was pretty fun. Nice. Trick. Yeah. Tight. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, what's weird is I found the mana base to be really like one of the things I think people think is that like Etron's mana base is nonsense. Or it's just like kind of just thrown together and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I think bait with the threats that are in the deck and the way it's built, I think it's really manageable and flexible where it's like you get these random hands that have like two Tron lands and one Eldrazi temple 
And then you're casting like a Warping Whale or a Mattery Shaper on turn two. You're sticking a Thought Knot Seer on like turn three. You're drawing into like an Expedition map eventually. And then you're making full Tron. And then you're kind of really aggressively playing to the board with like a Karn you have or that you draw. So like it, it comes together like way more often than you think it's going to. And like you, it's it's not quite as, because you have a lot more smaller creatures and more interactive spells, like you're not doing the green Tron thing where it's like, I need to just have a way to get to seven mana as soon as possible. Like this just does a lot more early on. So it kind of like naturally comes together with just the amount of cards you have available to you or it can operate without Tron just fine a lot of times. So Yeah, and I played against, I played against this deck and it, it was kind of miserable to be honest, <laughs> even on creativity, I mean, the stuff that it did because, you know, it attacked the access that was bad, that was fragile on that deck, which is this deck is pretty good at attacking a greedy mana base because it got Karn out fast. It got liquid metal coating going. I didn't have a Prismari command and then they just started destroying all my lands and it was kind of like, oh, that that's it. It's just it. Yeah. I mean, Karn still does nasty stuff. Uh, do you guys have any questions about kind of the main deck construction right now? I just want to hear how you feel about it. Honestly. Yeah, I mean, like, well, I mean, I want to talk about a few of the cards that I think are cool. I don't need to go into every one of them, but like, I think one of the interesting things here was Possessed Portal. Like, that's just kind of the most interesting piece of tech that I think separates this deck from another way to play it out because, like, it takes a while to get going and it hits you as well. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a symmetrical effect. So, like, but combining it with Mystic Forge is like really cool. Like, Mystic Forge is like a surprisingly important key piece to this deck. Like, it allows you to burn through your deck more efficiently. You're exiling cards, again, that can be used with Karn. Uh, it works really well in concert with the Maze Mind Tomes, because you can scry cards that you're, you're, you're seeing the cards, and you, if you don't want them... Like, you can do it either way, right? But I think it's it's a it's a nice uh, combo with, the, with uh, the Mystic Forge. And then Forge just lets you lock out your opponent, because you're going through your deck, and they're no longer doing so. But anyway, long story short, um, how'd the deck play out? I played an actual league. I went I went o two into three three two, which I'm fine with. Uh, I lost pretty conclusively to Hammer, and I lost to Living End because Living End showed me just how much anti hate this deck has to offer. Right, like, and then I beat always has. I beat Burn a couple of times, and I beat a, a Teamer kind of a Ragavan Shredder Ren and Six deck for the for the burrito. So what I like about it. I think the amount of interaction actually does feel smart right now. I think there's a lot of targets that you need and can take care of, like Ragavans and Ledger Shredders. Having ways to deal with those as you set up these like locks makes a lot of sense. Uh, Karn always rules. I think the artifact pieces in the sideboard cover a lot of different important matchups. The mana, I thought, worked surprisingly well. This is not necessarily a strength, but like matter reshaper is fine. Like it could be worse. It could be okay. Like I just, I mean, getting a, getting a land off of a removal spell never feels that bad. You know what I mean? Like what? It's kind of like oh, I like I got that. You know, Urza's mine. Like getting through your deck is never that bad. Weaknesses or sort of weaknesses, like weirdly thought not seer, felt good and not great right now. Like it's just it's it's a few years after it's printing at this point, many years after it's printing. It's just kinda easier to kill in modern right now. Like something like Unholy Heat or a Fury. Like it doesn't feel like you're getting a ton of value because they get the card back off of Thought Knots here once it dies. Or, or I think it's a leave the battlefield effect, right? So but it does stonewall small creatures nicely. It turns a corner nicely when you just like want that four four attacking in. Uh an actual weakness of this deck is that your plan takes time and can be disrupted. Weird. I mean, your plan can be disrupted and that's every plan in modern, right? But like, you know, force of negation in the cascade decks is going to get you, your card is going to get unholy heated. You're going to get turn three on hammer, just like you were playing Tron because like you had one piece of removal and it wasn't enough. Um, and that's an issue as well. But like one of the, I think there's a lot of strengths to this deck in that it's flexible but at the same time, I think to pay for that flexibility, you lose consistency. Or it's like your your ultimate game plan. If you, I mean anyone who will play this deck has likely played a Karn the Great Creator deck before, and Karn the Great Creator feels the same it always has, which is 
sometimes it's amazing, and sometimes it gets attacked by a, a creature on the other side, or it gets lightning bolted, and you're like, "Well, I wish I hadn't got that liquid metal coating or something like that." Like you just have to, you have to play, you have to be very smart and understand matchups really well, and that requires a format depth of knowledge that I honestly don't always have. Yeah, I mean, this to me looks like the type of prison strategy where you're always playing to your out where you're using karn to pick up the cards that'll make sure you don't lose right rather than trying to like use karn to get liquid metal coating because you think that's the most proactive thing to do with him in an effort to win faster yeah as opposed to like trying to set up an actual lock where your opponent cannot beat you and from there you start to piece together a, a win a winning line or a win condition. Yeah, my favorite thing about this deck, Stan, is like kind of like what you said, which is like you you piece together a win, and you have to do it in an iterative fashion because you're not just doing the Microsynth Lattice Lockout. You're not doing the uh, Possessed Portal Lockout because it's not a lockout. It's a pay, it's a hate piece that you have to give yourself enough time and stymie your opponent. Whether that's a few turns where it's like I got the bridge, I got the mystic forge now i can do the possessed portal and then like in five turns my opponent can do literally nothing and now the game is all mine and so it's it's really kind of a step-by-step lock process where you you're no longer cheesing things you're no longer cheesing out a chalice with you know fast mana and the mana monkeys and things like that you're no longer cheesing um, a lattice lockout like i said before it's really kind of how do i get to the position where my opponent is is screwed and I'm on two life. And even if they top deck a lightning bolt, I'm fine because my maze mind tome is going to get exiled. And then I can draw into like a worm coil engine or a basilisk collar out of my sideboard and have just enough life so that nothing they can do can pull them out of it. And that's kind of fun. Um, and at the same time, it's kind of sometimes unreliable because there's a lot of game plans in, in modern. There's a lot of ways your styming of their game plan can go wrong. Um, but yeah, I think this deck is cool. Like, I'm not like, this is like some new meta breaker, but I think that anyone who would ever play a deck like this should maybe take this for a ride. I think this is very tunable. I think this is configurable. I think that you can play it like you want. Like if you have particular Karn targets, you just love and aren't here, um, you know, throw them in there, take out stuff you don't like. Uh, if you want to play more warping whales or more dismembers, go for it. Maybe, uh, fit a fifth relic in there. I don't care. But yeah, it's a believe. Um, so yeah, I like it. That's my story. I kind of want to see you try like a War of Invention deck. Like oh, actually man. play a, a, a prison strategy where you're actually fetching up lock pieces at instant speed and outplaying opponents that way. It's instant speed? Can I, can I do that? <laughs> Dude, not, not only is it instant speed, it also has improvised. So you tap your Ooh. like random artifacts as mana sources. All right, well, I, I talked about that deck long enough, and I think there's one more host who needs to talk about a Magic the Gathering deck, and it's you, Stan. Oh, I need to do it. I need to do it. Um, I probably won't talk about it in as much length as you, Shane, perhaps because I'm not as passionate about it. Um, so people who are on Twitter or on Twitch may have seen front of the show, Aspiring Spike, tweet out a new strategy with the potential for turn two kills. This deck, of course, is Red Green Prowess. Now, you know I was annoyed with you when you called this deck for this episode. When you were like, let's do a Sleep Belief episode and I'm going to do this Prowess deck. I was like... (laughs) If it makes you feel any better, it's because I just picked up the deck and I was like, well, now that I've played this deck, how can I make an episode around it? Right. I know. (laughs) It's not always about me, but I was still like, that's my thing. But yes, yes, let's see where I mean, like, I'm curious where this goes because the big payoff in this deck is a card that I think most people have forgotten about, and that mm-hmm, is what mm-hmm. that is Thrasta Tempest's Roar, a dinosaur, Jar, a legendary dinosaur. Yeah, Thrasta, and- the last dinosaur, he's your friend, and a whole lot more. That was good. Did you just come up with that? Is that improvised? No, it's Denver the Last Dinosaur. Mm. No Dave idea what Denver. You're about. I mean, I've always said I'm willing to play anything if I can kill an opponent on turn two. H- haven't I always said this? No. Even a dinosaur. But it's a reasonable thing to say. Yeah, so 
For people who don't recall, Thrasta Tempest Roar is a green mythic from MH2. It costs 10 green green for a 7-7 trample haste, trample over planeswalkers, a line of text that I don't think has ever come up. Um, Thrasta Tempest Roar has hexproof as long as it entered the battlefield this turn, which kind of feels like an alchemy mechanic. But most important of all, this spell costs three generic less to cast for each other spell cast this turn. So because we're playing a prowess deck full of very cheap, if not free spells, the basic principle is you chain a bunch of Mandamorphos, Gut Shots, Lava Darts, Mutagenic Growths, maybe, you know, maybe another creature, maybe even a Lightning Bolt, you know, one or zero mana spells, and then you cast a a, a two mana, maybe a three mana, seven, seven, and, and just run over your opponent. For the most part, anyone who's familiar with prowess decks and just like even is it prowess or mono red prowess decks that have been popular in the past probably can imagine the general makeup of this strategy. It's got four monastery so spear, four soul scar mage as your prowess package. This one also has four dragon rage channeler um, and Mitra's bobble as another little package to get to the deck a little bit, or get prowess triggers, as well as having an additional evasive one-mana threat. Yeah, it's pretty normal for, for prowess these days in the post-MH era, you know, when Boros prowess was kind of the one we see the most, and sometimes there's the mono-red prowess, those those generally all have Dragon's Rage Channeler and Mishra as well. So If there's a card that I think those decks you're referring to don't have is another MH2 edition that uh, I was really excited to try out, which is Abundant Harvest. That's the single green sorcery. Choose land or non-land. Reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a card of the chosen type. Put it in your hand. Put the rest on the bottom in a random order. This one also, like, as an aside, kind of templated like an alchemy card, if I yeah. do say so myself. The cool thing about playing Abundant Harvest in this deck is that Spike's version is running 14 lands. That's so wild. To me, I didn't realize that until you pointed it out. It's that is fantastic. not very many. It's very few, in fact. And I wouldn't recommend you, that few for a limited deck, just to be clear. Like, that's well, below what you should do for draft. The re- yeah, I mean, look, the reason Abundant Harvest makes it work is that you can keep one landers with Abundant Harvest on the play. You are guaranteed to get to two, and you, o- you really only need two mana for this deck to function. Three, it's like really cooking. Anything beyond three, you kind of feel like you're flooding out. I don't know if you guys remember, but I'm thrilled to see Abundant Harvest too. I don't know if you remember that I said that I thought Abundant Harvest was going to be one of the most impactful cards from Modern Horizons 2 <laughs> during the spoiler episode. I was very wrong about mm. that, but I'm glad to see someone try it because it still seems really powerful to me. I mean, now certain shell, I'm sure, but... Yeah, I mean, I don't personally remember that, but I'm sure the internet did not forget. Yeah, yeah. It's up there with my take on Of One Mind. So I played two leagues with this deck. The first league, I went 4-1, and I was like, maybe this is legit. (laughs) Maybe we should buy eight copies of full Art Thrasta and spec on it. The second league, I went 1-4. And that's when I realized, maybe this is a prowess deck after all. (laughs) (laughs) It's like me talking about prowess. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so this first league where I went 4-1, I only cast Thrasta one time. Which is to say that Thrast is good in the turns where you can chain a bunch of spells when you have Thrast in your hand and you know that you need to make green green off of a Manamorphos and then you cast your Thrasta for just like an explosive, you know, seven points of damage essentially. And more often than not, she'll kill the pers- your opponent on the spot because after you're chaining a bunch of spells, like you're likely doing some points of damage with gut shots or bolts or lava darts and ideally you've played a, a, a another threat on turn one and you've racked up a bunch of prowess triggers as well but there on the other hand is thrasta didn't feel like she was essential to me and even in that 4-1 league i was getting some you know turn three kills or turn two virtual kills where i kind of just like overcommitted on a early prowess creature because i felt like i had to win fast and put a as much pressure on my opponent as possible and if they didn't quickly recover or you know didn't have enough time to build up whatever board state they're working on i'd eventually just like finish the job with a prowess trigger or just swinging with a one one you know on turn three and four your top deck a lightning bolt yeah. exactly and when you have 14 lands your top decks are pretty good 
because I felt Thrasta was, you know, non-essential, in the second league, I just swapped her out for Ragavans. And that was the one where I went 1-4. Even closer to the Boros prowess deck then, because that that is the it's all red creatures in that in that deck. It's just Ragavan. Yeah, and and my thinking there was if I'm going to play a very lean mana base, having a cheap threat that can also potentially like produce material that lets me cast spells later actually seems like it has some upside. Not to mention, you know, we all know Ragavan can run away with games when he's left unchecked. Of course, that's easier to do in a deck with counter magic. Um, which this, of course, does not have. And likewise, mutagenic growth, which this runs four of, like, isn't actually good enough to protect a Ragavan just because, you know, maybe it'll dodge an early on a Holy Heat, but most people are just casting Lightning Bolts or Fatal Pushers or, you know, other very decisive kill spells. Definitely. It's funny how close this list is to Blue Prow, Blue Red Prowess with just the green cards, you know, like... Thrasta is Stormwing Entity, Dragon's Race Channeler, Sprite Dragon. Like, it's really close to the same core. And it's trying to do a similar game plan, especially because you have all the mutagenic growths in here. But it's just a more bursty payoff, but mm-hmm. no protection, basically. Yeah. yeah and, and I guess that's one of the situations where Thrasta shines, where she doesn't really need the type of protection that Ragavan does. Um, you know, she basically exists for these explosive kills that you can, when you can either string together, you know, um, a bunch of really powerful cards that were in your opener, or maybe like if you've reached the mid game turns three or four, you've taken the turn two and three off to put together a big play with cards like Manamorphose or Light Up the Stage and other cheap spells that you then commit to casting a Ragavan or a, a Thrasta because you know, opponent isn't going to be able to disrupt you on the stack. So here's the good news with this deck. Prowess does have a high ceiling. Love good news. Yeah, and you're going to love this. Spike, in my genuine opinion, demonstrated that the Prowess archetype does have room for innovation. You know, I think a lot of people gravitated to, is it because of Stormwing and Sprite Dragon once upon a time, Expressive Iteration 2, and and maybe even some cantrips? We saw the Boros one emerge when, um, you know, I, I don't even remember what that wizard is called but that strixhaven white card strixhaven white card oh clever lumimancer yeah clever lumimancer yeah clever lumimancer and then later on it just got rid of it and kept the good modern horizon removal basically mm, prismatic ending yeah yeah ba- that was basically all that was yeah but what what i think spike's list proves is that you know among other things abundant harvest is a decent card in shells like this because it essentially guarantees that a prowess deck that is trying to chain together a very specific series of cards can find exactly what it needs in those situations. Um, Especially when you find yourself in a position where like all you need to do is draw a land, Abundant Harvest is going to find you that land and all of your lands in turn untapped. I think this deck also sort of confirms, for me at least, that DRC plus Bobble in a prowess shell is just an effective package of both supporting other prowess creatures because bobble will trigger prowess on on swift spear or soul scar but it can also help keep you in the game a bit longer if you're going into like the mid to late game turns three and beyond you know sometimes it's a one mana three three but other times just having like a couple surveil triggers to ditch those unnecessary lands to make sure that you draw into either another threat or a Thrasta or a cantrip or a burn spell, sort of give you that additional reach or that additional action you need to cast two to three spells in a single turn, which is generally what Prowess needs to do to, to find a killing line. So the good news is good cards are good. Abundant Harvest might be a good card after all. The bad news is that there are turns where Thrasta is just uncastable and opening hands where she's your only threat felt like particularly bad to me it's almost like we talked about this in the spoiler episode for modern horizons too yeah 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 it's like a tougher to cast Stormwing entity you know which is rough because the fallback is impossible yes and you need three spells instead of two yeah or one yeah and uh, the, the other thing to keep in mind is just like an ideal line with rasta is that you have a turn one prowess creature and then on turn two you're chaining some bobbles some anamorphos um, maybe some gut shots, casting of super cheap Thrasta, and then, you know, swinging for 15 or more damage, right? But when she's your only creature and you're just chaining 
you know, maybe some lava darts and gut shots and cantrips. She doesn't really necessarily do enough to close out the games in a single swing. Um, and though she has hexproof, the turn she comes down, when she sticks around, like she becomes very vulnerable to, you know, solitudes. Maybe opponent will have to two for one you to, to answer it with two and holy heats or like a fury and something else. But you've probably used up all of your resources and you've left with an empty hand because you've committed to casting Thrasta that if an opponent has two for one you to answer her, they're not necessarily all that far behind because they probably still have action to keep the game going for them. Yeah, it's like the Archon of Cruelty problem. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, I did all this stuff. I did what you wanted me to do. And then, you know, you let you let it get solituded. So that was my experience with Thrasta in particular. The, the other point in my bad news category that I don't want to belabor too much, I, I think there's been a lot of spilled ink on this, I kind of just think prowess is an iffy choice in the very interactive modern metagame that we are in right now. Um, because I just found that more often than not, decks are really good at keeping you in the back foot since they have a ton of free to one mana removal spells. And this deck essentially cannot operate without a lasting board presence. So even though my threats are cheap, and they can get big and explosive, my opponents are still answering them with cheap spells as well. So you're not actually really getting an advantage out of those exchanges. It's just like one-for-one resource trades that are usually costing one man on both sides of the exchange. I think that's, as you know, a long avowed prowess lover, I think that's a good take right now i don't think it's particularly good i think part of the reason that prowess as a deck isn't great right now is because lava dart is just fine right now when lava darts absurd and you get two cards off of it a lot the deck is a lot better overall you know and that's that's just not where we are right now so yeah i mean lava darts an interesting case study too because it's just like feels great to kill a ragavan with a lava dart but then you know if you're targeting certain creatures out of yagmoth they come back bigger and better right <laughs> you know like you don't necessarily want to target them with it. Um, uh, I guess you can kill an early DRC, but like the DRC decks are shaving on DRCs. Right. You know, Merc yeah, Mer in particular is just playing a 1 3 now. Yeah. 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 So, so the verdict for me, I'm going to give it a, a glass half full, believe minus, because on the one hand, I do trust Everett judgment right and and he was very excited about this deck he played it over a couple of days over several leagues he was playing it in off time and i think he did at least demonstrate that thrasta has impressive play potential and is you know bare minimum just an unexplored piece of tech that can fit in certain shells and and the condition can be met to make her a good card maybe this just isn't the final version of gruel prowess or more importantly, maybe it's just like, now's not the time for Gruel Prowess. And Thrasta can sort of exist in the sidelines along with Abundant Growth for when Modern becomes more about ships passing in the night. Um, which, in my opinion, it isn't really that right now. And this is the type of situation. And, and, and when Prowess was one of the top decks, like that's exactly what the format was about. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean yeah. MH2 reinvented Modern as people of more, more smarter than me have said and yeah it's hard to kind of bring a deck like that back into what modern is has become but yeah i don't know i, I still had fun I, I, there was this brief glimmer of hope that maybe maybe i can show up to the rcq with this explosive new prowess deck and turn to a bunch of unprepared opponents uh, but it really only took me two leagues to realize like there's a reason prowess isn't really the deck that it used to be and this isn't necessarily solving those problems. It's just trying to find a new way to prowess opponents and still is, in my mind, pretty susceptible to a lot of the issues that sort of push prowess out of the format when we got Prismatic Ending and Unholy Heat and Solitude and Fury and all the other cards that Modern yeah. Horizon 2 is about. Exactly. All right. Well, sort of a lackluster sleeve, believe, heave, zero sleeves, a believe, a believe minus, and a <laughs> yeah. heave. So you know keep exploring there's stuff out there to to look at but mm, you know at least for my part my deck was kind of confounding shane liked his stan i think felt medium as it turned out right yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we got 
what we wanted out of this, which is talking to each other for another hour and 40 minutes, going back to old school dive down length episodes. Yeah, Dave, I actually played against your deck and I beat two resolved archons thanks to a little sideboard card called Run a Foul. Yeah. <laughs> How about them apples? Yeah, that's brutal. What are you going to do? That is brutal, but hey, we had fun. And as Shane put it, we had fun together. But I think that wraps up this week's show. Thanks, guys, for another week of Modern. Listeners, if you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to our podcast so you get the latest episodes as soon as they come out. And if you use Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and review. If you'd like to submit a question to the podcast or just reach out to us in general, you can tweet us at the dive down, all one word. You can also email the dive down at gmail.com. If you'd like to support the show, you can join our Patreon. Find us over at patreon.com slash the dive down. You can even support us while playing Magic Online with promo code the dive down 15. A little bit of a misnomer. Right now, Dive Down 15 gets you 10% off your first two months of renting Magic Online cards over at Mana Traders. Still worth it, though. You're not going to find a better deal elsewhere because this change was made across the board. Even Mason Esports Clark, I think. You can get some amazing shaving soaps, body soaps, fragrances, and more over at Barrister and Man using the Dive Down 15. And that code gets you 15% off your first order with Barrister and Man, now shipping to the UK and the European Union. And get a discount on some physical paper magic cards over at Nerd Rage Gaming with the code DIVE8, which gets you 8% off your order there. As always, special thanks to the bands Nowhere and Space Blood for letting us use their music. And until next week, get out there and win more modern. Thrasta, the last dinosaur, he's your friend and a whole lot more.